Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition is a standalone tabletop RPG by Cubicle 7. It was published in 2018 and carries on a tradition that started in 1986 with the first edition by Games Workshop. The second edition was published in 2005 by Black Industries and third edition in 2009 by Fantasy Flight Games. This fourth edition comes in a single 352 page core book that contains all the rules for character creation, game mechanics, spells, bestiary, and regional world primer. The Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay system has always been known for its gritty realism, and this is reflected strongly in character creation. There are five distinct races or species in the setting, humans, halflings, dwarves, high elves, and wood elves. But if you follow the book's suggestion of choosing a species at random, which is rewarded with more starting XP, then you actually have a 90% chance of choosing a human, and only a 4% chance of getting a halfling, or a dwarf, and a paltry 1% chance for getting a high elf, and 1% for a wood elf. This is one of my favorite tables in the entire book. It suggests so much about the humans of the setting, that they have won out over the other races, probably through brutality and dominion. If played in the spirit of the setting, the non-human races are fleetingly rare, and the scarcity makes them special, almost radiant in their rarity. Class and career are the shining jewels of this book. There are eight classes, and each contains eight careers. Out of these 64 careers, most of them will not be recognizable as traditional adventurer's jobs. You could be a lawyer, a nun, a rat catcher, villager, or even a flagellant, messenger, or stevedore. These careers remind me of the great list of careers in Burning Wheel, except here they are presented in a way that can be quickly and easily chosen at random, and each career is given a full page in the book with a fleshed out career advancement path. Each career page is your character's roadmap to character progression. Most characters are limited to some degree by species, but once you start a career, there are actually four levels. Each career level also contains specific skills and talents that you can invest XP in in order to qualify into the next level of your career. The core attributes or characteristics of your character are used when rolling tests. There are a whopping 10 attributes in this game, and they range from 12 to 100. When rolling for a test, you're rolling a D100 to get at or under the target. Thus, the higher the attribute, the better. The attributes are weapon skill, ballistic skill, Strength, Toughness, Initiative, Agility, Dexterity, Intelligence, Willpower, and Fellowship. From these numbers you also derive wounds, or how much damage you can take generally. You also use these numbers to derive other key features of your character throughout play, such as corruption, critical wounds, encumbrance, etc. Since the game was originally derived in 1986 as an offshoot of a tabletop war game, you will see some vestiges of that heritage here. For example, you have separate weapons and ballistic skill attributes. And for quickness and general dexterity, you actually have three characteristics, dexterity, initiative, and agility. For the record, initiative determines your combat order as well as intuition and perception, while agility controls your coordination and athleticism. Dexterity in this game controls your ability to perform fine and delicate manual tasks. And in case you're wondering, willpower determines your resistance to influence and coercion, fear and terror. Fellowship is like the more traditional charisma. You get a number of starting skills based on your species and career. Each skill is associated with a characteristic. Over the course of play, you can either boost the characteristic itself, which will boost the associated skills, or boost the individual skills. You can always test a basic skill, but advanced skills must first have some advanced points dumped into them. There are only so many listed skills named in the book. That being said, some skills encompass a group of subskills, such as language. There are 17 named languages in the so-called Old World. Lore similarly has 9 subspecializations. Although lore and the skill of trade as well as some others, are unbounded, and you could subspecialize in virtually anything you can think of. You get a few talents at character creation, and you can buy new talents with hard-earned XP. Talents are much like skills, but they are taken multiple times. Every talent has its own upper limit as to how many times it can be taken. This is essentially a level. Some talents are simple and straightforward, like Deadeye Shot, and others are more mechanically involved, like Dual Wielder. 
By my count, there are 167 listed talents in the game. Aside from the wildly varied careers that you can choose from, this galaxy of available talents is where the player's experience can be different with every character for years or decades of play. There is a random talents table for starting characters, but it only contains about 20% of the available talents in the game. Talents are otherwise accessed through your career. Experience points are how you advance your character and are rewarded at the end of a session. When first creating a character, you can earn a small pile of XP just by rolling randomly for species, class, career, and starting talents. Later on, you can spend XP to level up talents, spend 100 XP to leave a completed career, which is required to move up a career path, or spend 200 XP to leave an incompleted career. As for the actual rules of the game, you have tests, which consist of throwing the D100 and trying to get at or under the related skill or characteristic value on your character sheet. If you happen to have a talent that modifies your role or your approach to the test, you state that at the table, preferably before your roll. If you roll a 96 to 100, it is considered an automatic failure. If you roll a 1 through 5, an automatic success. A simple test is trying to answer a yes or no question. Did you pass or did you fail the situation? These are used for situations in which it doesn't matter by what degree you pass or fail. A dramatic test is trying to answer how well or how poorly you've done. You calculate this by subtracting the tens die that you just rolled from the tens value of your tested characteristic or skill, and the higher this resulting difference, the more spectacularly you succeed. Likewise, if you failed the initial roll, your success level number will be a negative value, and the lower the worse. The GM can make any test easier or harder by modifying the target number. There is a table in the book for adjusting the target. Opposed tests involve two characters rolling D100s against each other with the higher success level winning. Ties are given to whichever character has the highest tested characteristic skill. The book offers myriad rules variations for tests, some intended to speed up play or to extend a test into a series of rolls for more drawn out situations. Combat in Warhammer Fantasy starts with initiative. Since every player has a static initiative attribute, you can actually seat players in initiative order at the table to keep things moving along. Of course, you can also opt to roll for initiative at the start of every battle, and the book suggests several ways to do that. At the start of each battle, the element of surprise needs to be sorted. Surprise can be achieved or avoided by hiding, tactics, distractions, flat-footedness, or perhaps magic or other shenanigans like special talents. Being surprised will saddle the PCs with the surprised condition, one of the many conditions you can pick up in this game. You get one movement and one action per turn. The book does not necessarily stress movement distances very much, but does cover the mechanical ins and outs of combat movement. At the very core, you do need to be very close to an enemy to hit them with a melee attack, and for ranged attacks you do need line of sight and to be within range as defined by the weapon itself. And for each round you also get free actions, such as shouting something or drinking a potion. Attacking and delivering damage is a bit involved. Here are the steps. 1. Roll to hit. Let's say you're attempting an axe swing at a rat ogre. You would roll a d100, and the GM would roll a d100 in what's called an opposed melee test. The roll with the higher success level wins. The winner gains plus one advantage for this. Count up these advantage points with coins or some other game markers. If you roll a double number and succeed against the target number, it's considered a critical hit, and the rat ogre suffers a critical wound. The critical wounds tables are all kinds of fun. They all deliver one heinous condition or another as well as potential injury or death. 2. Determine hit location. Do this by reversing the numbers on your opposed melee roll and refer to the table. 3. Roll for damage. Every weapon has its own damage characteristic. You almost always modify this number with your strength bonus which is the tens value of your strength characteristic for melee weapons and some ranged weapons like bows, or some fixed number for other ranged weapons. Then add the success level from your opposed melee test in step 1. You now have a potential damage number. 4. Apply damage. Creatures in this game have hit points, but they're called wounds. Take your damage number from the previous step, subtract the rat ogre's toughness bonus and any armor points it has protecting the area of its body that you hit, this number is how much damage you have done. If it exceeds the rat ogre's total wounds, 
It takes a critical wound for the affected area, and also takes the prone condition. You can oppose any incoming melee attack with other things, like dodge skill, or maybe with the help of some other talent that you have. This would simply change the target number that you're rolling against in step 1. Just like with non-combat tests, combat roll targets are modified depending on the situation. The book provides a table to help the GMs understand context, where adding 20 points to the combat target is the standard. As with any meaty rulebook like this one, you're going to get rules and options for fumbles, death blows, dual wielding, unarmed, and mounted combat, and on and on. One mechanic worth mentioning is the advantage system. So remember in step one of the fight with the rat ogre where you won the opposed melee test and got a plus one advantage? You can accumulate those in a variety of ways during battle, like charging, or using an assess skill, or defeating an important NPC, etc. Every single advantage point that you have adds 10 to any related test during that combat, so you can quickly become unstoppable. But you can also lose all of your advantage points when you take damage, pick up any condition, or when combat ends. There are a total of 12 so-called conditions in the game, all of them bad. The effect of the same conditions stack, which means you could have bleeding 1, at which time you lose 1 HP or wound per round, and have a 10% chance of dying outright at the end of each round. But with bleeding 3, you are losing 3 wounds and rolling for a 30% chance of dying every round. The good news is that if you have two different conditions with the same effect, you only suffer the worst of the two. The conditions range from horrible to debilitating, and the primary way to remove them is by rolling a related test. With bleeding, for example, it would be a heal test. You can also remove conditions by spending resolve points. Resolve points are precious points that your PC starts with. You can only pick up more resolve points by acting in accordance with your stated motivation as written on your character sheet. Similarly, you have resilience points, which are also gained by GM's discretion when you push forward your motivation narratively. You can spend resilience to automatically win a test or to avoid a horrible mutation. These points should be particularly hard to earn. Then you have fortune points, which you can spend to reroll a test or gain some sort of edge in battle. Then there are fate points, which can be spent to avoid death at the last minute or dodge an incoming attack. Like resilience points, these are very hard to re-earn. I have to say with regard to these categories of fudge tokens, the authors could have probably combined these into just one without anyone losing much sleep. With regards to granularity, where and how you take damage in this game is extremely detailed. There are three major families of injuries, broken bones, major and minor, torn muscles, major and minor, and amputated parts. Even something like a minor broken bone will take 31 to 40 days to heal and will leave that limb useless until then. And even at the end of the healing period, you have to succeed an endurance roll or permanently take negative 5 to tests involving that limb forever. There are additional stated penalties for lost toes, tongue, teeth, ears, and the major limbs. You can also suffer performance penalties in the midst of drowning, suffocating, freezing, starving, and suffering from thirst. There are also 9 named diseases that you can catch. You can achieve death in this game by running out of hit points or wounds while picking up the unconscious condition and having more critical wounds than your toughness bonus. If no one comes to heal at least one of your critical wounds within that last round when you picked it up, you die. Among other ways, you can also die by rolling up the last entry on any of the critical wounds tables. The game offers an interesting sort of countdown for your character called Corruption. Your PC can gain corruption points in two ways. One is by participating in a dark deal, where the player buys a re-roll in exchange for taking on a corruption point. Another way is to be exposed to a place, person, or object that is tainted with the so-called chaos, the force that encompasses one brand of evil in the Warhammer setting. At least with the corrupting influences, you can roll an endurance or some other test to avoid picking up the point. If you pick up too many corruption points, you will end up having to roll on either the physical or mental corruptions table. It's usually the mind that starts to go, although from a meta perspective, I've got to say that it's probably less disruptive to play a PC with a physical deformity than it is one that is expected to behave completely differently. But both tables are a lot of fun. 
As it were, if you pick up too many of these mutations, your character is surrendered to the Chaos Gods, and you have to roll a new character. You can bleed out corruption points by allowing the GM to guide your hand in one situation or another towards something evil, or by seeking absolution through some pilgrimage or visiting some holy site, or destroying some horrible relic. Some characters have the ability to channel divine powers through one deity or another. In the Warhammer fantasy setting of the so-called Old World, there are several major pantheons which provide a potpourri of different gods. There are the Old Gods, which come from the times of forest tribes and barbarians. Then there are the Classical Gods, which are the modern gods worshipped in the urban areas. And of course you have the hundreds of provincial gods, as well as Sigmar, the mortal who founded the empire and became a god. Then you have the Chaos Gods, which are demonic evil and quite dangerous in every respect. You also have a pantheon of Dwarven Gods and Elven Gods, and even some Halfling Gods. Although it's a lot of gods to sift through, if your character wants to use any prayers, which are like minor divine spells, or blessings and miracles, which are more detailed and powerful divine spells, then they need to pick a god, and fortunately the book names the 10 most prominent gods of the Empire. The Empire, by the way, is the main realm of the setting, dominated by humans and forever plagued by dark forces, official corruption, and war with its neighbors. The Empire has these 10 gods, each of which is quite nicely detailed in the book, which provides the ins and outs of how to avoid the wrath of your chosen god. Blessings are the real deal in terms of divine magic, and when you have the blessed talent and a chosen god, you get six blessings right out of the gate. There are 19 named blessings in the book, each of them a buff or a heal. Finally, you have miracles, major manifestations of divine will. The invoke talent is required, and gives access to 5 or 6 unique miracles based on your chosen god out of the 10. Since each god has its own thematic essence, each of these miracles is also tied to that theme. So for example, if your god is Mor, the god of death and the ferrying of souls to the next realm after death, your available miracles are things like these. Most magic in this setting is sourced through so-called winds of magic, which is an invisible force that flows through everything. These winds come from the ether another dimension linked to the old world through a dimensional rift. The winds are divided into eight types, or lores. Each of them also have an associated color. You can cast a spell by making a language magic test, then compare your success level to the casting number of the spell itself. The success level needs to meet or beat that casting number. If you fail the cast, nothing happens. If you happen to roll a double number, you get to roll on the very fun minor miscast table. Your character also needs to be wearing the color of the magic you are trying to use, otherwise they take a penalty on the casting roll unless their chosen magic type matches that material. By rule, humans in this game can only learn one type of magic, while elves can learn as many as their willpower characteristic will allow. The eight color magics each have eight listed spells for a total of 64 spells here, but there are 23 listed arcane spells, which are generic spells that can be channeled through any other discipline. You just need the arcane magic talent, but this greatly expands any caster's available list of spells. In fact, arcane spells don't exist on their own. They have to be used through the prism of a pre-existing lore. So for example, there is no bolt spell, but rather a fire bolt, chaos bolt, shadow bolt, etc. This two-part synthesis required of any arcane spell being cast does require a modicum of creativity from the player, but makes for a huge list of fun and dynamic spells. Besides the 64 color spells and the 23 add-on arcane spells, you have several other lores. There's the witchcraft lore, which draws from any available winds that happen to be blowing. Using witchcraft spells will accumulate corruption points, and requires the use of ingredients, which will always involve some gross animal body part. This book lists six witchy spells. There are also 25 petty spells, or cantrips. These are technically a part of the witchcraft family of spells, but don't carry any of the grossness or corruption. Then there is the whole dark magic family of lores, which include eight demonology and necromancy spells in the book. Finally, you have chaos magic, these come from three of the four great powers of chaos in the setting, and the book lists just three of these spells. 
Surprisingly, there is no corruption mechanic for casting these spells, even though the setting treats the force of chaos in other places as extraordinarily dangerous. The primary location, as presented in this 4th edition book, focuses on Reichland. Reichland is the main sort of capital province of the Empire, and the Empire is the predominant realm of the Old World. The Old World is the continent that encompasses the setting at large. I'm not going to go into detail here, but it's worth mentioning that there are about 20 dense pages dedicated to Reichland, and they cover the geography, the politics, and the types of settlements as well as the named individual towns that adventurers might find, as well as a four-page timeline of major historical events. This whole section gets pretty heavy with the text walls, and is a departure from the rest of the book, which has a more dynamic and forgiving layout. There is another 20 pages dedicated to things you can buy. Although I'm glossing over this entire chapter as well, it bears mentioning that if your party likes to dwell in town and trade, then you have been provided in this book the very fabric of mercantile life in Reichsland. Bolts and bolts of fabric. Also worth mentioning is that this is where you'll find weapon and armor stats. These stats contain vital information that has bearing on combat. Weapons in this game do not stray from the medieval fantasy archetypes, but of course they do have their own mechanical quirks as compared to other games. Likewise, armor is pretty standard, but since this game's damage model is complex, armor stats and details are important. For example, armor can be used to negate a critical wound, at which point the armor itself takes damage. You would still take normal wounds from the blow, by the way. The bestiary at the end of the book is a lean affair, yet filled with more brilliant artwork. Here they really try to embrace an economy of space, fitting two to three creatures per page. But it's dense nevertheless since the creatures are each assigned a list of one and two word traits that carry with them a ton of information. There are about 40 fantastical beasts here. Once you read through these, you'll finally start to get a complete picture of what the Warhammer fantasy setting is all about. It's a very scary place with truly nightmarish monsters. Hopefully you get the idea of what Cubicle 7 has pulled off here. This is an all-in-one tome that tries to revitalize a legacy system from the 1980s. The layout is beautifully done and easy to read, although there have been some complaints about how parts of the same role are scattered throughout the book. For the most part, the art is sublime, and the system itself is gritty and punishing, full of corruption points and horrible injuries that never seem to heal, and other pathways to your character's spiritual and corporeal doom. The setting, although not of Cubicle 7's invention, is a brilliantly dark and fleshed out Germano-Anglo-Dutch medieval world, filled with hundreds of gods and a brain-melting amount of political and civilizational detail. The standout for me, though, is the careers. All 64 of them have a four-tiered path of progression, but since most of them are non-standard fantasy classes, peasantry and so forth, you are directly inserted into the setting's gritty realism. So roll up a beggar and die a horrible death. If you would like to engage with Warhammer Fantasy RPG enthusiasts, check out the Rat Catchers Guild on Discord. It's a rigorously organized server full of very nice and helpful people. Thanks to Moo Man for helping me get the details straight for this video. Links for stuff are below. Thanks for tuning in. This is Dave signing off. See ya.